In today's conversation, we're chatting with Mr. Nick Shaheen, Chief Compliance Officer at Financial Services of America. You'll have a chance to hear about Nick's background, his role as the firm's CCO, as, along with views on the most recent regulations facing the wealth advisory industry. Nick, super excited to have this conversation with you. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Nick, as part of our uh, prep conversation, I got a chance to learn a lot about your bio and your background. It's an understatement to say you've been a leader in the compliance industry for some time. And if someone were to just take a step back and take a look at your profile, I, I'm curious what really kind of got you interested in this wedge of the, uh, of the investment industry. Um, it's a good question. And I think like a lot of, um, you know, CCOs kind of got here on accident. And so uh, when I graduated college in 2010, kind of coming out the you know, back end of the GFC, I uh, wanted to get into finance and major in economics, but there weren't really a lot of positions um, available that weren't, you know, kind of that client facing sales roles, because obviously companies could hire in those positions because it was, you know, commission sales related. So when I graduated, got, uh, you know, had a few different offers for different insurance and, and sales positions and found the Financial Service America, the company I'm at now, and just, you know, ended up being a great opportunity for me. Uh, started off in our insurance or home and auto sales, was one of the top producers for a number of years. Um, so, you know, eventually transitioned to getting my securities license, moved over to the financial planning side of our business. And with the deal all coming out, you know, in 2017, 2016, we were reevaluating our business model, ended up deciding that we needed to create an RIA. And uh, for whatever reason, I was tapped as the person uh, to get the licenses and be the CCO. And, um, you know, from there, it was just kind of slowly transitioning from that client facing role to more of the back office compliance operations. And, um, you know, could have never imagined uh, 12 years ago when I started, this would be the, the role and position I'm in, but uh, it's, you know, been a great journey and uh, just, you know, kind of continue to grow and involve with the company and the position as it's needed. Nick, I can't tell you how many people, including myself, who kind of suggest that this, this journey uh, in the investment industry sometimes happens by accident. You know, you, you, as a finance major or someone with a finance background, predominantly you think, hey, portfolio management, investment banking, some of those jobs that are kind of on the on the news headlines and then suddenly you learn about this whole new side of the industry that that's uh definitely value additive uh, and that uh, um, i'd say engaging to say the least speaking speaking of kind of some of the regulations that you're you're helping your firm comply with over the past i'd say maybe uh three four years there's been this culmination of uh new regulations regulation best interest department of labor's you know, fiduciary rule 3.0 or PTE 2020-02. Um, and they're, they're by and large, they're, they're very sort of uh, a significant enhancement to the uh, advisor-client relationship. Uh, as someone with, you know, with, with your tenure and your level of experience, Nick, is, is, what do you, how do you believe these specific regulations are going to uh, uh, shape our industry uh, moving forward? Um. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, huge, you know, impacts these, you know, kind of big, you know, best interest fiduciary rules. They, um, I think the end goal or kind of what they're, what all these regulations are trying to accomplish is really good for uh, the end consumer and really good for the industry and in making sure that financial advisors have to put their clients best interest first. Um, I, I think kind of taking a step back and, you know, when some of these, you know, rules first came into place and, you know, kind of explaining it to clients that, you know, why there's maybe a new disclosure form or documentation as part of, uh, you know, our process and exp explaining, well, there used to be this, you know, suitability rule and now there's this, you know, fiduciary rule. And I don't think many people would think that a financial advisor in the past and, and in some aspects today don't have to do what's in their best interest. And it's, uh, you know, really kind of head scratching that, you know, wait a minute, why would the industry have ever, you know, allowed that? And, and, and um, it just, you know, kind of, Again, like I said, head scratching. So I think the end goal of what the right, you know, what those regulations are trying to accomplish is a really good thing. Uh, I think the hard thing taking a step back is, is trying to figure out what the most effective way to accomplish that goal is. And it's certainly hard because there's so many different 
governing bodies and regulators putting their own spin or own version out there because the, the, the financial services industry is so fragmented from the RIA space, the broker dealer space, you know, the insurance side, you have obviously even, a, you know, you know, SEC registered versus, you know, state registered firm. There's so many uh, governing bodies that it, it's hard to have that kind of just uniform consistency rule. Uh, so again, I think that the end goal, what they're trying to accomplish is great. Uh, I don't know if all the extra disclosure is really helping and are kind of accomplishing what they want it to. Uh, you know, a lot of the new forms uh, just creates additional paperwork going to consumers. If anything, maybe to create more confusion just because instead of getting a, um, you know, they used to get a, a firm brochure, an individual brochure, now they get a CRS on top of it. Now they have, you know, extra comparison forms. Uh, I don't know how many consumers are able to really understand and interpret what they're looking at or even you know, how many advisors can understand what they're looking at and going over with the clients for that matter. And so what I'd almost like to see is more education, um, you know, both for at the advisor level, you know, so they have a better understanding of different products and what's available. And, um, and then obviously to help educate the consumer as well, um, you know, where they would have a better understanding um, of different financial products out there, how to evaluate things. Because um, at the end of the day, no, you know, no consumer is going to sign up for, you know, here's two competing mutual funds and one has a higher fee, one has a lower fee. And, you know, here's the reason why there's the higher fee. No one's picking that, you know, in, you know, maybe thought as an inferior product, but they don't have any knowledge to know that, you know, that's out there, that there's different share classes in a lot of cases. And so, you know, if there is a way you know, probably, you know, uh, certainly high school, maybe even dating back into, you know, middle and elementary school to start helping get that financial education out there, uh, you know, may put consumers in a better position to understand, evaluate their options and really work hand in hand with their advisor to build that financial plan for themselves, as opposed to just, you know, going to an advisor and, and taking their word for it and hoping the advisor has a good understanding of the product that's being sold and, you know, the plan that's being implemented. Um, so I think that's something you see with uh, more sophisticated, higher net worth investors. They typically have more of an interest. They spend more time there. They're better educated and therefore can make better decisions. So um, again, I think the, what the regulations are trying to accomplish is great. And there's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, and maybe there's some you know, steps that could be taken in the future to help increase the education and you know, maybe make things more uniform across the, across the industry and make it easier for you know, the end consumer to understand what's going on. Love, uh, love your remarks here, Nick, because um, as you said, just layering on disclosure is seldom ever going to result in improved outcomes for investors, which is the underlying goal of those regulations to begin with. If you kind of, it sounds like a circular reference for those who are Excel wonks like me, but that's kind of, that's kind of the, the challenge in a way, right? Because yeah, when you layer on additional disclosures, um, is that really going to change the outcome or the impact on the investors' financial assets or, 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 or livelihoods? Um, to your point, it's knowing the better share class given the client circumstances to invest in, the, the lower cost share class or lower cost mutual fund, um, which sort of segues into the next question around what are your thoughts about in the face of all these regulations, you know, PTE 2020-02, Reg BI, considering alternatives, um, you know, uh, what, what role do you believe technology can play in, in, in helping firms and advisors? Um, you know, technology can play a, a huge role in, in not obviously helping the firms, advisors, even the consumer in, um, you know, creating that education or that, you know, kind of comparison, that, you know, for a client that may not understand or be able to evaluate different share classes. For example, if there's technology out there that can simplify and show the difference of, you know, here's the, you know, maybe the extra cost from, you know, fund A to fund B and, and maybe how that impacts performance, you know, technology can certainly put that data in and maybe make it in a, a user-friendly uh, way for the, the consumer to, you know, understand and, and interpret themselves. Uh, but in terms of helping firms and advisors, because there's that additional disclosure and that documentation, technology can certainly streamline and make those processes more efficient and, and uh, you know, just make it easier for the advisor to do their job. And at the end of the day, you know, still be able to service and, and help consumers. I, I think that's one of the concerns with some of these new regulations is that, 
because of the additional workload put on the advisor and the firm for this additional disclosure, is that going to make firms not be able to service smaller accounts? And, you know, if a firm has to put in an account minimum, you know, million, half million, 250,000, whatever it may be, um, that may either create um, a lack of advisors or a lack of advice for, you know, some smaller clients or clients just starting off um, or, you know, limit or limited access to resources that maybe they can't get as good of advice or they can't work with, um, you know, the best advisors. Um, and, and at the end of the day, that may end up hurting consumers more than, uh, you know, than things were in the past. So technology being able to streamline and, and help that out uh, can definitely play a huge role. Uh, but I think a big thing with the technology is making sure that it fits into the business model and the planning process that the uh, advisors are using and to try to streamline and make that process, you know, even easier for the consumer, easier to understand. There's a lot of great technology out there that just doesn't fit what the advisor of the firm is trying to do. Um, I know I talk to our advisors all the time. They'll talk to me about this. Hey, I just saw this really, you know, cool piece of technology and ask, well, well great. How are you going to use it? How does it help your process? And, uh, you know, just, you know, kind of layering in technology for technology's sake uh, certainly doesn't help anybody, the consumer or the, or the advisor, uh, but finding that right, you know, piece of technology to take the advisor's process and simplify it, streamline it, again, especially those repetitive processes that document and disclosure process can play a huge role for firms uh, to make their process easier, make it easier on the consumer, uh, as well as, you know, you know, make the business, you know, run a little smoother and have the compliance documentation that makes people like me uh, happy, makes our jobs easier. Hey, that's, that's the spirit of it, man. That's exactly the foundational principle of, of technology. And as Steve Jobs says, you know, the computers are supposed to be the bicycle to the human beings and technology is effectively borrowing from the same, <laughs> maybe cheesy analogy and at this point in time, but uh, uh, from a compliance perspective, you know, why would you want to take uh, the approach of chasing manual paperwork across, you know, thousands of rollover recommendations, thousands of product recommendations, if you can have them all stored, the due diligence documents, all the way to client disclosures in a centralized place. Obviously, uh, um, unbiased having uh, been <laughs> working at a, at a software provider in this space, but I think we aligned on that philosophically. Now, speaking of theory and, uh, and philosophies, and if, if, one word to say, hey, Nick, you, 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 uh, you found a, you had a fortuitous way of getting into the compliance side of the industry. What if Nick had a magic wand? What if Nick could uh, sort of wave that magic wand? What would you do to make our industry a better place for everyone? Um, kind of goes along with something I, I had mentioned a couple minutes ago, and it's creating the consistency and the clarity across all these different regulators, all these different business models, you know, from RIAs, SEC and state register, broker dealers, um, insurance licenses, um, and even, you know, the, you know, different components of the insurance license. There's so many different governing bodies, so many different regulators, um, you know, DOL, everybody kind of, you know, has their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak, and it makes the advisor's job very difficult. Um, it, you know, creates even positions where advisors say, well, I'm going to drop my series seven or i'm gonna i'm only gonna operate in this channel which at the end of the day to me doesn't make the you know the business model of the process the best because they're now limited on products that they could you know offer consumers and you know there, there might be an annuity product that might or an insurance product that might be best for that client but they're not licensed so they're going to um you know, maybe lean towards a, an inferior option for that particular particular client because of the licenses they have. So um, I'd like to see, you know, if the regulators could somehow get together, um, create more consistency, have this, you know, have the same or, you know, same rules and regulations. So, um, you know, firms aren't kind of wearing, well, if I'm wearing the BD hat, this is the rule I have to, you know, follow. And if I'm wearing the RA hat, well, the rules very similar, but there's you know these one or two points that are a little different that now we have to follow. Um, I, I think would again you know make the firms and the compliance side of things a lot easier, a lot more consistent. Which at the end of the day can maybe decrease some of the regulation and the documentation that we had also talked about earlier. And again, make the process for the advisor client relationship a lot easier. Um, you know, and again at the end of the day, you know this you know. This is really all about helping consumers, help, helping individuals 
have great financial lives, have the financial freedom and security that they're looking for. Um, and while the regulators certainly need to protect them, you know, there, there's certainly op opportunities to make things better for them by just, you know, having, a, I think, a more uniform process and, and having more clarity for advisors and knowing how to operate um, and deliver, that, you know, the best experience they can to, to, to the end, end client, the end consumer. Fantastic. Well said, my friend. Make things simple as, as, as or keep things simple and, and, and make things uh, um, maybe eliminate the barriers between different uh, regulatory organizations or I've heard the term regulatory arbitrage come up a number of times in my career. Couldn't agree with you more, uh, Nick. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure speaking with you. You're so uh, uh, insightful with your with your comments and uh, hope we can catch up again soon. That's great. Thanks for having me, Farm. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Nick. Please uh, like this video, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel for more on our Wealth Compliance Leader Series.